not only is he a pastor, but he is a master of apologetics. He's working on a Ph.D. degree now that deals with why young people, and I'm abbreviating this, leave the church and why some stay. And it is a fascinating study, but I'm going to tell you what he is very good at. He's very good at proving that the Bible is true from archaeology, from history, and showing that creationism is real. Now, if you're going to take notes, you probably won't take them as fast as he's going to go through this material. I've told him, take your time because I want you to absorb it. Now, folks, listen to me. I hope that not just people who have kids came. Because some may say, well, you know, I believe in creation, so it's no big deal. You encounter people all the time that don't believe God put this thing together. So you need to know something. So without any further delay, and they've hooked him up with the mic, he's going to have to test his mic maybe for a minute or two, make sure we get the kinks out, Dale, and it sounds good for him. But I want you, we always, as you know, we want this to be a tradition here that when we introduce speakers, even singers, that we let them know we love not only the anointing and the gift, but the person. So would you stand to your feet and welcome to this platform Dr. Michael Knight from Kentucky. Amen. How many of you are glad to be in God's house? You can be seated. I'm glad to be here. I tell you, I, am, I feel like I'm a man in debt tonight. For many reasons, uh, one brother uh, Stone and Miss Pam affected my life many years ago at Lee College. Anybody know where that's at? I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit under Brother Perry at North Cleveland Church of God when I was 18, and I'll forever be indebted to that, and I'm going to get a little emotional, but Brother Perry, my 14-year-old, received the baptism about a month ago. How many of you know that's important? Amen. Amen. Uh, I'm old, I don't wear glasses because I want you to think I'm smart. I wear glasses because I can't see. <laughs> uh, and I want to say thank you to Dr. Overhagen, who's a spiritual father to me. God bless you, you've made an indelible uh, impression on my life. And I want to say thank you, um, and I'm not one to do a lot of, um, of this stuff, but I thank God that a guy named Dr. Beach, who the science building is named after, at Lee, his wife, named after his wife, got a hold of me when I was backslid and not serving God and taught me apologetics and gave me one little simple word, the missing link. And I, I thank God for that because um, we're going to go on a little journey tonight. How many of you ready to go on a journey? Say amen. <laughs> now, before we get started, I want to see who has the word of God. May I see it? Would you hold it up in the air? I see. Very healthy place. Who's got something to take notes with? Very, very important. The notes I gave them to Jonathan uh, yesterday and sometimes this week, extensive notes will be up on a website somewhere. So I have notes for everyone here, but there's, thir there's 33 pages of notes along with an extensive bibliography. Because I want you to know what I'm about to say is extremely controversial. There are evolutionists that will try to def de debate it, and of course that's to be reckoned with. But I want you to know that I'm after truth tonight. Anyone else in here after truth? Say amen. Now this is a very complicated subject and it's going to take some time and it's going to be about an hour and a half and I usually preach about 30 minutes. But we're going to teach. How many of you can take that kind of training so that you can have apologetics? Can I see your hands? Now the problem is we could talk for, for four weeks on it. Now let's start out. i got to admit my bias. My bias is that I've struggled on a journey on how God made man. I really have. I have I've struggled and I've kept an open mind about it. I found myself vulnerable with macroevolution. Macroevolution says that God, or that, that, that um, evolution created a man uh, and, and species turned into another species. They literally teach that a dog about the size of a sheep dog actually evolved into a whale. Um, I don't have that kind of faith, okay, man? Um, and so I've been vulnerable to macroevolution. Microevolution says that there's a survival of the fittest and that there are changes within species within their same species. And so I've been on this journey fluctuating uh, left of center until I began to truly study about evolution and study about whether it was true or not. I'm a, I'm a very, um, I don't want to say gullible, I'm not gullible, but if uh, someone says something, unless they lie to me, I take them at face value. So when I go to museums like the British Museum, or I go to the Los Angeles Museum, or I go to Washington, D.C., the Smithsonian's, which I love, 
um, I go in there and I believe what I see. I never would have thought that a museum would lie to me or that they would be on an average of 15 to 25 years behind on correcting their exhibits based on new science. Now, uh, I, so I began to study and I began to check out what I, want, what I was seeing. As a matter of fact, I have friends that are theistic evolutionists. They believe that God used evolution to form the world. I looked at museums and scientists and textbooks and I found out that they weren't necessarily um, on the up and up on what they were saying because I believe that God created the heavens and the earth. Someone say amen. And I believe that God uh, loves man and that he placed man on earth. And I, I talk about this at the ISO New Bible College on eight videos on cosmology, on archaeology in the Old Testament, archaeology on the New Testament, on naturalism. And if you don't believe there's a God, you've got a whole problem already because you're looking at me with a set of eyeballs that is an evolutionary impossibility. Not to mention the bumblebee. Where would you like to start? Would you like to start with cosmology and understand that the dirt underneath your feet is anointed for life because had God not formed tectonic plates underneath your feet, you would not have the ability to have life, that even the dirt is unique to life? Do you realize everywhere you look, you can see the hand of God. Can I get an amen? Amen. If I get a little bit more monitor, that would be great. And so I've discovered that there's this rift between macroevolution and microevolution. I believe in microevolution. I do not believe in macroevolution to where one species turns into another. And I'll explain that in just a minute. Therefore, I want to make sure all of you understand that I am a born-again Christian. And I believe that God created the heavens and the earth. There's some things that I'm absolutely sure of. Can I get an Amen. One of the other things that I'm sure of is I'm, I'm, a, I'm a firm believer apologetically that Jesus Christ was and is the Son of God. I also believe that the Bible is the Word of God and that is absolutely accurate and that whoever wrote it is God and I know that it was inspired by the Holy Spirit. Because I can take you to the Old Testament and I can show you 50 people that the Old Testament shows as real human beings. And then I can take you to archaeology and I can show you proof that 50 people in the Old Testament actually existed. And outside of the Old Testament, we can, we can prove their existence. Somebody give God a hand clap of praise for the accuracy of the word. And so I, I believe it's the Word of God. Also, i got to admit that while I will not change the Scriptures to fit my worldview, I will remain open to the facts because I love facts and I hate reading fiction. I like to read nonfiction. I like to know truth. Can I get an amen? And so with those understandings, I must acknowledge to you that if my facts were to somehow change, it would not change my God. Because at the end of the day, if they find 20 horses in the crustacean period, it's still a horse is a horse is a horse. And if they find a monkey underneath the Precambrian fossils, I want you to know that a monkey is still a monkey that is still a monkey. And if they find human beings in the Jurassic period, a human being is a human being is a human being. But when they find a whale with a leg sticking out of it that used to be a man animal, we're in trouble. But I'm telling you, we're not in trouble because our faith has a reason and we can defend our faith and know it intellectually as spirit-filled charismatics and we don't have to back down to this world, but we can give a defense that is inside of each and every one of us. Somebody say amen. Now my last confession. I feel like I'm back to being, I'm from a charismatic Catholic background. I feel like I'm at confession. I wish I could tell you that I am St. John. I am not St. John. I wish I were. I've studied St. John with archaeologists for over 30 days recently on a, a study tour with archaeologists. I'm not St. John. I'm St. Thomas. Nice story. Let me see your hands. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think it's perfectly okay to say, that's a nice story, I want to see the proof for it. Someone say amen, I got quiet in this Presbyterian church. <laughs> and what I've learned about St. Thomas is that St. Thomas was actually uh, the greatest soul winner out of all the 12, if you study his life. One more souls than anyone. So are you, getting, are you ready to go? Put that first slide up there if you don't mind. How many of you are ready to go? 
Let's give the Lord a shout of praise. Amen. Because we're in a little bit more monitor because we're dealing with some very dusty stuff. I want you to know this is what we're going to do tonight. We are going to take a good look at four subjects. We're going to look at the theology of man. And I'm going to go very quickly because the theology of man, uh, I'm preaching to the choir. But it's important that we lay the foundation of the theology of man. We're going to move from the theology of man to the fossil records. Charles Beach told me many years ago that Michael Stephen Jay Gould at Harvard University cannot prove evolution because there's a missing link. The fossil records do not support it. That's very simple. Most of you know that, but I'm going to show you the complexity of the depth of that knowledge tonight. I, we're going to move from the fossil records to random mutations. You may think mutations is mutant ninja turtles, but I got news for you. We're going to go into random mutations. From the random mutations, we're going to go into the anatomy of the human being and the ape. If you're going to know how to defend yourself at a museum, you're going to have to know how God created an ape, and you're going to have to know how God created a human being. We will move from the anatomy of the humans and the apes, and we'll have to go to the fossil evidence of ape man. They say there's lots of proof that ape man existed and that an ape developed into a human. We shall see. Then we'll go into microevolution and the results that evolution on a macro level really does affect one's worldview and thinking. One of the things you've got to realize as we start about evolution is that evolu evolutionary theory or every sin in the Bible is condoned by evolution. Every one of them. So are you ready to go? Say amen. amen. Now, the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, always be ready to give a defense. It's the Greek word apologia. And what we need to know is that we have to get some definitions here. Operational science is what they call the scientific method. It means we can test our variables. We can know exactly uh, that it is in a controlled environment and that it actually happens. Origin science takes today and then tries to understand the history from origin science. What you need to understand about these is that evolution has a definition. Evolution says that all living things arose randomly from inorganic, inanimate matter. It says that things that have no life gave birth to life. It says that things that have no cells, things that have no blood, things that have no life inside of it actually gave birth to things that have life. And they're interrelated. Man is related to monkeys. Birds are related to dinosaurs. Uh, Sheepdogs are related to, to whales. And so when you study evolution, you have to understand that what they show you and what they tell you is really based on four assumptions. Those four assumptions about evolution are the following. Number one, spontaneous generation. If evolution, classical evolution, macroevolution is true, then this means that life arose out of inanimate objects. Life came from primordial soup. And they just happen to have the perfect combination of carbon-based molecules and DNA and nuclei and cell walls and all of the ability to have life inside of a cell that was created without life giving life to a cell. That's called uh, ludicrous. <laughs> Tell the Easter Bunny I said hello. Spontaneous generation. Well... Evolution demands spontaneous generation, but it also r r demands random mutations. Random mutations are minor changes in the DNA code. And I'm going to show you some very offensive pictures tonight. And I'm going to say some very offensive things where I quote people at the end. But you have to know we're not going to ignore the elephant in the room. There is a problem with people who are theistic evolutionists and believe that they can keep that in line with their Bible in every area. What evolution develops in the life of a human being is very, very concerning to me. Random mutations means that when you have your DNA cell, which uh, your DNA, which is in a genome, and it gives the information to the cell in your body. Charles Darwin said the cell was simple, that there was nothing to it. We now know that that was an absolute uh, miscalculation, that he did not have the science that we have today. We have much, much more uh, molecular biologists and knowledge today than he ever thought about having. So we have information that's different. 
So when you look at random mutations, what happens, the DNA is a book and it gives information to the cell. When uh, God put inside of each and every one of you three billion letters spelled right in an order, and we'll talk more about that later, but there's an information system in you called DNA. If you were to take all of the books ever written since the beginning of Adam and go all the way to the day, you could put all of that information in the teaspoon, uh, the DNA of a teaspoon and still have room left over. There is not a more complex, compact system of information in the whole world than DNA. Nanotechnology, uh, how many of you remember the eight-track tape? Let me see your heads. Uh, the cassette player, how many of you remember that? Now, how many of you remember the nano? Now you got your iPhone, and information continues to get compacted because people are studying uh, DNA because DNA is the most resourceful compact system created in the earth ever in the history of man for knowledge. Isn't it interesting that when scientists and engineers want an ant, they have to, st- or want a, want a tank, they have to study an ant. And when they want an airplane, they have to study a bird. And when they want a, a submarine, they got to study a dolphin or a sea turtle. When they want to know how to build the best Bose speaker, they have to study the ear. When they want to build the greatest camera in the world, they have to study the eye. You see, when God created you, you were created with a purpose. And when he wanted a bird, he spoke to the sky. And when he wanted a fish, he spoke to the water. And when he wanted a plant, he spoke to the dirt. But when he wanted you, he spoke to himself. And when he speaks to himself, ladies and gentlemen, your potential doesn't come from an orangutan and a pre-mortal soup in a La Brea tar pits. Your potential comes from the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and the fairest of 10,000 do my soul. You have to realize this is not a mother goose rhyme. This is the truth of the living God. Somebody shout yeah. yeah. Excuse me. (laughs) Evolution teaches that spontaneous generation, random mutation, and natural selections are elements of evolution. Natural selection I believe in. It is called microevolution. When I grew up in western Kentucky over by Clarksville, Tennessee, you would never see an armadillo. Today I see armadillos on the road dead all of the time. The armadillos, when I was young, were mostly indigenous to Texas and places like that. But they've come into these areas and they have transformed through gradual, small steps of natural selection, survival of the fittest, and they've adapted into their environment. And so what you have to be careful is believing classical evolution, which is macroevolution, where species turn into different species. And what's amazing to me about that is, doggone it, we know that DNA does not change. The only way, the only person in the world ever to get away with blood DNA and be a crime was O.J. Simpson. Anyone else will not get away with it because DNA doesn't change. And then you have time, and time is uh, the real issue and the reason they keep moving it back. Well, man was 9 million years old, and he was 100 million years old, and he was 150 million years old, and it was 540 million years old before the tribal lights came, and it was 100 or 520 million years, and it was billions of years. The reason classical evolutionists continue to have to move back time is because their own theory does not have enough of time to be true according to the laws of mutation. Now, we're going to get into that in a minute. Touch your neighbor and say, sit still. It's going to get good in here. Now, what I need you to understand very quickly, okay, is that if creationism is true, creationism is this. Creationism doesn't necessarily mean that you believe in six little days of creation. There is great Hebrew for it, and there's great Hebrew against it. What you need to understand is that evolution or creationism did not happen by itself that God spoke and this world came into existence. That God is the creator. So creationism is the belief that life was intentionally designed. You're not a mistake. Your mother did not have you by accident. I'm here to tell you that not one kid underneath the sound of my voice has been birthed by a mistake. God gave you purpose and he said, I know the hair on your head. I believe there's a designer that designed this beautiful earth. Isn't it ironic that out of all the places you can study the universe, earth is the best seat in the house? It's true. 
This God intentionally planned to produce the universe from all forms of life. So we're talking about three distinct stories here. I want to talk to you very quickly about the theology of the man. Psalms 8 and 3 says, When I consider your heavens and the works of your fingers and the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you're actually mindful of him? Now listen to me carefully because I'm going to go back to evolution and monkeys and dinosaurs, but I've got to get this foundation. Everybody give God a hand clap of praise if you don't mind. God is a methodical God and God is a precept upon precept God. And so God does things in order and in decency. When you look at Genesis chapter 1, 1 through 5, you will find out that there was a separation between the light and darkness which produced day and night. You understand that that is a provision to mankind because light requires that there be light source outside of darkness. And day and night requires that there be a rotating planet. When you look at day one, God had the water and he covered the earth with the entire water. Water requires that a planet which it might cover is the focal point, earth. The planet requires space in which to exist. When he said he created the heavens, that which is beyond the earth, that which the creator himself created for us, the creation of space demands a creator. Day two, you see where the expanse was dealt with in, the, uh, uh, in cosmology. It's a separation of water requires the presence of water. An expanse requires a planet above which to exist and space beyond the market's boundaries. Day three, you see in chapter one, verse 11 through 13, the vegetation. You see that there was dry land and sprouts with vegetation. Vegetation requires what? Vegetation requires soil, vegetation requires water, and vegetation requires light. Moses was not a science, and the, uh, scientist, and the Pentateuch is not a book of science, but I'm sick and tired of these liberals and these backslidden theologians trying to tell you that the Bible is an anti-scientific book. They say the Bible says that the earth was flat. The Bible has never said the earth is flat. It was the Catholic Church that said the earth was flat. My Bible always said his throne encircles the earth. When you begin to look where the vegetation requires soil and water and light, then you find out that there was dry land, the appearance of dry land out of the water. Soil requires to be raised uh, land and a land surface standing out of the water for there to be plants. The gathering of the waters from the seas are important because seas require the lowering of the earth's crust to produce an ocean basin. And don't let you, don't let the, don't let people fool you and say, well, we found life potential on another planet. And they say they found water. Water on the earth is not water on other planets. And I don't have time to get into that. But what you need to understand is that the Bible says that light's in the expanse, ruling over and identifying daytime and daytime, night, days, years, and seasons, men call time. Seasons require vegetation. And placement in the expanse requires prior existence to the expanse. In other words, time requires light and darkness. So you must understand in Genesis 1 and 20 that the birds and the waters of the fields began to fly in an atmosphere that God created before he created the birds. And fish swam in the waters before God, uh, after God created the waters. Water creatures require water. Birds require atmospheres to which they can fly. Then God made mankind and put mankind in an environment. He spent six days before he placed a man in the environment he worked on six days to create. And this is where preachers and theologians get in trouble and I got to hurry. But the point is, when you look at Genesis 1 and 26 and it says, let us make man in our image. This is a personal pronoun, first person to identify the activity of a Godhead, the Trinitarian experience. He created a male and female. The person listening to me right now is a male spirit. Out of that male spirit, he created male and female. And God revealed a purpose for that man. He said, be fruitful and multiply and any races that are not part of that humanity or humanness is not covered by God's retributive justice that he had to deal with when Cain killed Abel. So you have to be very careful about saying that Adam was not the first human being. And you have to be very careful in your theology to say that Adam was mythical. He was a symbol. He was one of many men. That is dangerous theologically speaking. To speak of other humans is a contradiction of terms in Genesis. As a matter of fact, Talidah, 
which is the word in Genesis 2 and 4, translates genealogy or translates history. And Moses sets the family history of the Word of God into motion in the book of Genesis. Take away the historical Adam and there's no father for humanity. Furthermore, if Adam is a myth, legend or symbol, theologically, where and when do you decide in Scripture who's not a myth? Archaeologists have proven that Abraham and the city of Ur is real. Archaeologists have proven that the Tigris River does flow out of Assyria and that the Euphrates is there, just like the Bible says in the Garden of Eden. And so you have to understand that in Genesis 2 and 7 it said God formed a single individual, not multiple individuals. And I was open to understanding that maybe this was more than one. But verse 7 says he gave him the breath of life and said he breathed into him and man became a living soul. So the Bible does not say that somehow he created these hunchback monkeys that were walking around, had no brain, had no sense, had no ethics, had no morals, didn't bury their dead. Isn't it amazing that the things they call cave men have the ability to make beautiful art on the side of a cave? Isn't it amazing that there's a difference between you and a monkey? A monkey does not bury their dead. Animals have no remorse. When my bulldog ate a goose, he wasn't sorry about anything. He didn't look at me and say, I'm so sorry, please forgive me. No, there isn't any remorse in animals. And, and man is creative above the ability of any animal. Animals may create birds, but when was the last time you looked at a bird's nest and saw daffodils one year and roses the next? You don't. Because they're limited in their creative ability. God didn't form life out of an animal. He formed it out of the humanness of the human soul and that first man's name was Adam. Animals don't bury their dead. Animals have no moral compass. They'll eat you if they're hungry. Look straight ahead, amen. The problem is 1 Corinthians 15 and 45 says the first man, Adam became a living soul. Genesis 2 and 10 says that God placed Adam in the garden in a geographical place. And we know that what begins to happen is that God begins to put the generations of Adam together. And then we know that Adam was a personal pronoun, but yet people will say in the Hebrew, he doesn't have the article in front of his name, therefore Adam may not have been a real individual. Well, the same is true for Jacob and Abraham as well. And that there is no article in the Hebrew when it comes to saying Jacob or Abraham. And we know that Abraham was real. And we know that Jacob was real. And we know that Moses was real. And we know the Egyptians are real. So the problem of being a mythical Adam is theologically perplexing to any of us because we have to understand Adam, if he's not a real human being, affects the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. And we knew that Adam didn't think that he was like any of the other animals. That the other human beings, some say that, well, what if there were other human beings there? Well, then why was he alone? And why does the Hebrew word alone not mean lonely? It's the Hebrew word for self-existence. And why did God say, the monkeys are looking at you, Adam, we're in trouble. You don't need to be dating her. That even Adam knew as a homo sapien that he was different than the animals. As a matter of fact, God noticed that there was not a suitable helpmate amongst the animals for Adam. So be careful with theistic evolution that says somehow something walked around on bare knuckles and on two feet with no amount of bipedality and that they began to actually uh, grow up and begin to walk up straight and then all of a sudden somewhere in that process God went... <sighs> That's very troubling. You see, the Scripture does not contain anything consistent with secular science hypotheses regarding biological evolution of mankind. The name of Adam most consistently, consistently occurs with a definite article like Abraham, Jacob, and David. The problem is you have when you believe that there was a possibility that there were men before Adam is that you get into evolution and evolution is a record of death. And what happens is the Bible said Adam was to guard. Same word for the Levitical priest, to guard and to take care of. 
In the Adamic genealogy, what you find is that they called her the mother of all living things, and that Adam in the book of Genesis was a personal pronoun. But it's very complicated to your theology and your ethics, and here's the reason why. Number one, Job says, I covered my transgressions as Adam. 1 Corinthians 15 and 20 says, But in fact Christ has raised from the dead the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. And for as by man came death, by man also came also the resurrection. As for all in Adam, all die. Paul says, and he uses the two terms for Adam, anthropos, which is man, as well as the personal pronoun name for Adam, a human being. Therefore, you have to understand that if you believe that God used any other uh, techniques outside of, of creationism and microevolution, you're in trouble already. Because the Bible says in Romans 5 that sin came into this world through death. And that if sin came into this world through death in man, and then uh, the Bible says in Romans chapter 8, verse 18, that even the creation, the plants, the animals, yearn for the creation to be fixed from its futility. That they too have troubles with mutations. And so what you begin to realize is that the animals and man have been cursed by the fall that Adam and Eve fell into. Luke 2 and 38 says Adam was an, uh, an ancestor to Jesus. Jude 14 talks about the being the seventh from Adam. Acts 17 and 26 says, And as he made one every man of every nation to live on the face of the earth, having determined allowed at times, it begins to talk about the first man, Adam. So we ask our question, when was Adam created? And I'm going to get, so just hold on there with me because I've got to lay this foundation. Most evolutionists believe that man arrived 200,000 to 400,000 years ago. We call them Homo sapiens. As a matter of fact, from the time of the Big Bang to the arrival of man is over 3.7998 billion years, according to evolutionists. Young earth creationists say about six to 10,000 years. And so what you find out is that there is Genesis 1 and 29, a God who says this is very good. So now you're in a real conundrum, a conundrum because all of a sudden you're believing that something other than a literal interpretation of Adam being a real person is now up for grabs and that somehow things died and cancer died. We have found cancer in dinosaurs. We found cancer in prehistoric men. We have found rickets and arthritis. We have found cannibalism. We have found the, the fact that children died at a very early rate with infanticide. Everywhere you look, you see death. And the Bible says that death did not happen until Adam sinned. And what is a fossil record? It is a record of death. It's a record of death. And when my six-day little creationist friends cornered me at AIG in Florence, Kentucky, I had to look at my feet as a good Pentecostal and realize that I was in danger because my entire Bible had just fallen apart. I said, Romans 5 says death entered into the world through sin. And then I said, aha, I got you, because they didn't say anything about animals. Then they quote Romans chapter 5 verse 18 to me, or 8 verse 18 that even the plants and the animals are suffering futility and the result of the fall. And what I begin to realize is that there's a major problem going on. Are you ready to go? Say amen. amen. So we start with the understanding that a fossil record must understand that our Bible, and let me tell you something, you've got to be very careful. I'm going to show you a picture at the very end tonight where you've got to be very, very careful because you are limited and I am limited by the science of our day. Darwin was limited by the science of his day. Uh, Charles Templeton was limited by the science of his day. Billy Graham's best friend that became an atheist. Many people are say and they go off half cocked because the Bible is disproven because no one mentions the Hittites. Well, that's until 40 years later and they dig up 11 Hittite cities. So, with that being said, give God a hand clap of praise. Amen. 
Without a little Adam and a little fall, the gospel is now nonsense. There's the danger. Charles Darwin actually said that there was a common ancestry. All forms of life have ultimately descended from a single common ancestry somewhere in the past. Natural selection says they adapt to the survival of the fittest. But the fossil records, which are the bones of contention, are extremely important tonight. So what you need to realize is that the Bible says if you don't praise me, the rocks are going to cry out. So therefore, if creation is true, if creation is true and God created the heavens and the earth, we would expect to find in the fossil record, we would expect to find a sudden explosion in the appearance in fossil records of highly complex forms. In other words, nothing gradually comes about. What good is a half of a centipede to a centipede? We would predict that fossils of all major types of plants and animals would appear and would appear abruptly. Because we believe God spoke and they were created. We believe that God spoke and plants were created. Evolution says it takes hundreds of millions of years for this to happen. So we would also expect to find no sign of transitional forms linking one basic type to another in the fossil record. In other words, they believe that a dog the size of a sheepdog actually dwelt on the land and became a great white whale. Therefore, if that is true, the fossil records must show us transitional forms of fossils. There must be a sheepdog with a flipper somewhere at the Cambrian or Precambrian fossil stratification. And there has to be a monkey who doesn't have the ability to walk in bipedality, which means you walk on two legs, and that he still walks like this because of his pelvis and his ankle bones, his femur and his tibia, and then he turns around and begins to look a little bit like a human. There are no transitional fossil records ever found in the history of the world, and when they tell you that they have, they're lying to you. including Ida in 2009. We found the missing link, a lemur. You know what they ended up saying they found within a few months? A lemur. (laughs) So if creation is true, then each basic type of monkey, apes, men, cows, elephants, cats, dogs, horses, would thus be found fully developed if creationism is true. If evolution is true, then we would expect to find plants and animals which would not appear abruptly. That we would find a plant that is developing in between stages of transitional forms. That we would literally find a sheepdog developing a flipper because he's about to be a great white whale that we would literally find a dinosaur, and this is what they believe, that is moving through the transitional stages in the fossil records, and all of a sudden a dinosaur becomes and becomes a bird. So if evolution is true, I, sometimes I think they're smoking a lot of pot. Somebody say amen. <laughs> if evolution is true, we would expect to find plants and animals which would not appear abruptly, but appear within their transitional shapes and forms missing links, and they would not appear in any highly complex forms. So what you have to understand is when evolutionists talk about the fossil records, they love to show their tree. Well, the truth is the tree is a lie. That even evolutionists know the tree isn't real. That the trees are out of shape and that they no longer are that clean. Ask any evolutionist and they'll tell you the trees of Darwin or his bulldog that he had, Heckel, uh, isn't true. Now, what you have to understand is they want you to believe that a monkey started out in classical evolution as a microevolutionist and that all of a sudden he began to walk and all of a sudden he began to walk upright and all of a sudden he began to walk like this. They want you to believe that a, a dinosaur gets up here within these fossil records and all of a sudden bursts a bird. I'm going to tell you something, that's a pretty impressive dinosaur. I got to go. Now, watch this. Evolution teaches, and mark this in your little book, evolution teaches that it must happen gradually, 
that it cannot happen quickly. They've even come up with a new theory called punctuated, punctuated equilibrium, which kind of helps them with their time to say animals came out of a nest fully formed as a bird. The problem with that logic is the mutations and the probability mathematically of that ever happening. I have a more uh, faith to believe that a tornado can come through OCI and reassemble it as a 747 than I do the fact that that's ever going to happen. But if punctuated equilibrium is true, then what that means is that if a bird was punctuated in his equilibrium and actually came out of the egg fully formed, then at the same time another nest has to have a bird that is at the different sex than this bird and he must too be punctuated equilibrium because this bird that's punctuated equilibrium has enough of sense not to sleep with his mama. <laughs> now look, watch this. Fossil records are so sure that we even know where we find stuff. As a matter of fact, there is the Cambrian period, which is the lowest level of life, trilobites and, and uh, uh, brocobites, those kind of things. Underneath the Cambrian area are pre-Cambrian things like worms. And what's so interesting, there's a news uh, article in Breitbart News where they found yesterday, they just came out and said, we found the first step of life. I thought, okay, you had me at hello. Uh, I began to read about it, and it says it's the shape of a sand on the seashore. I thought, okay, God must have thrown sand in the sea. And it says it's black. I said, okay. And then what got me is what the evolutionist said. Now, if evolution is true, extensive transitional forms must be found right here. They just found a new form in the Precambrian level which, level, which they never find much of nothing. And they found one in the last couple of weeks, or at least they told about their findings. And you know what they said? They said, when we put it under a microscope, our jaws dropped at the level of complexity. You have to understand there's a two-pronged challenge to this. That if evolution is true, we will find transitional forms here. But take a good look at the picture and notice the explosion of life and the stratification of rocks. Life, according to the scientific geologist, did not show evolution on a macro scale where there are transitional forms of beings. The fossil record literally shows that somewhere in history, someone must have spoke because in a boom, everything appeared completely formed and healthy. Somebody give God a hand clap of praise. This is so pronounced, guys, that we even name the different periods in the geological column based on what we know we find, and we judge the geological column by its surety because we know what we find in the geological column. So we know in the Cambrian period, there all of a sudden is an explosion of life. We know in the Precambrian period, they found worms and they found this new, very complex organism. But here's what Charles Darwin said. He said, the difficulty of understanding the absence of vast piles of fossils in the stratification of the rocks, which on my own theory were no doubt somewhat accumulated before the Cambrian epoch is very great. I allude to the manner in which numbers of species of the same group suddenly appear in the lowest known fossil records. Even Darwin knew this was a problem. What you have to understand is that at the bottom of the Cambrian period, we find two things in life. We find the brocopods, which are two shells, they look like clams. And we find the triobites, which are three longitudinal lobes. They have three parts. They have a head, a chest, a tail. They actually have eyeballs. And we know, and Darwin knew, that evolution is impossible for an eyeball. That eyeballs cannot evolve. And so when you look at the lowest fossil record of triobites, at the Cambrian fossils, what you see are complete complexities of vertebrates and invertebrates. 
which you do not see this with a half of a vertebrae. You see it with fully developed eyes, fully developed vertebrae, and, and spinal columns. Somebody give God a head clap of praise in this place if you don't believe. And so these were tremendously challenging to Darwin when they found these in the Cambrian fossil records because he depends on random variations. He depends on all of these organisms showing up slowly and gradually in different half forms. So evolution's traits must arise randomly. Thus micro mutations must happen in a species over a long period of time. In other words, if a dog develops into a whale, it has to happen over a long period of time. And that's problematic because science has proven that mutations actually bring about deformity and death. What do you think cancer is? Cancer is a mutation. Cancer is a mutation. And that we now know, I'm about to shout into a Pentecostal jig if you knew where I was going. I gotta get a drink of water before I do that. Anybody learning anything? What we now know is that science has proven that mutations bring about deformity and death. We know in biological, uh, um, uh, biological medicine that mutations are dangerous. Evolution says that species cannot transform into another species through macroevolution without the aid of positive mutations. And so this is problematic for evolution because only minor variations uh, meet the Darwinian test. Furthermore, natural selection requires an enormous amount of time to generate a wholly new organism. So Darwin admitted that building a trial bite with a single cell organism will require thousands of trans... Uh, tr uh, tr uh, uh, thousands of transitional forms over a vast period of the, the fossil records. And what we find is that the Bible was correct. We see life happening all of a sudden and very developed. But Darwin says if evolution is proven to be true, paleontologists would f find below the lowest known strata of animal fossils a layer of intervening strata showing fossils in increasing complexity until finally trial bites appear. And what we found were complete trial bites at the Cambrian level of fossils. And we found out that there isn't a gradual uh, changing of the species. What we found out is what the Bible says. In the beginning was the Word of God and the Word of God spoke. And we now know that God said He looked at it and it was very good. Hey, somebody say amen. Darwin said, if my theory be true, it is indisputable that there before but below the lowest Cambrian Stratification of fossils was deposit. Long periods elapsed, as long as probably farther than any before, and that the world swarmed with living creatures. And now what we found out is they found one below the Cambrian, and it was a living creature, and it was in the ocean, but it was not in a transitional form. It was completely complex to cause an evolutionist to scratch his head and say, my goodness, this thing in its complexity, quote unquote, is jaw-dropping. So the Cambrian fossil record shows an explosion. It shows an abrupt appearance. The uh, Harvard scientist, Agassiz, actually was the most respected scientist in the 1800s, 1850s, when Darwin was alive. And he refuted evolution theory based on the Cambrian period and mutations. Geologists have found no merit of transitional forms leading to the Cambrian animals. There's the truth. So the Harvard scientist says to Darwin, to the question as to why we do not find rich fossils deposited belonging to these assumed earlier periods prior to the Cambrian system, Darwin says, I can give no satisfactory answer. The case at present must remain inexplicable and may be truly urged as a valid argument against my ideas. Somebody give God a hand clap of praise. Got to hurry. The Precambrian, an absence of transitional fossils, intermediate fossils, and animals, we saw it beginning to develop in a startling array of complete forms. So what did we find below the Cambrian? We found complete forms of life, not transitional life. Now, he said, shh, be quiet, because transitional fossils are perhaps the most obvious and serious objection to my theory. Oh, Hallelujah. Somebody give God a hand clap of praise. I got to go. 
Random mutations. I know that when you think about random mutations, I want you to think about Colossians 1 and 16. It says he created the visible and the invisible. I want you to understand that mutations is not X-Men. Great movie. I don't understand all of it. I have to ask my eight-year-old. But when we think about mutations, we actually think about mutant ninja turtles or this thing. But the truth is, this is what mutations does. This is what they do. When you talk about mutations, you're talking about things going wrong, like feet coming in the place of your hands. Now, I don't mean to offend you, but these are not actors, and these have not been photoshopped. When you talk about mutations, you're talking about the werewolf boys, and I have a friend, they're actually the oldest carnival family in the history of America, 150 years. You're talking about Jojo the dog and P.T. Barnum. You're talking about the men and children and beautiful girls with two heads. You're actually talking about frogs with two heads and cows with two heads and lambs with five legs and babies with eyeballs in the wrong places. This is, ladies and gentlemen, a scientific fact that mutations are harmful to human beings and that mutations barely ever happen in a positive way. So you need to understand that a genetic mutation is a permanent change in the sequence of the genome, which holds the DNA, which is the instruction book for your life. You must also understand, look at this child with uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten toes on each leg. Random mutations are minor changes in a cell's DNA. And remember, a cell is completely complex. And they are said to result from outside radiation. Look at the uh, nuclear mistake in Russia and Google mutation in children and see what you get. Natural selection says that things adapt to the environment and macroevolution says evolution changes from one species to the next by use of mutations. Now that's problematic because microevolution talks about changing one basic thing to the other. Microevolution talks about small changes like uh, armadillos. But when you look at what they teach about mutations, they actually teach that a whale started off as a dog about the size of a sheep dog and then through classical evolution and macroevolution developed into a whale. And I'm going to talk about that in just a minute. That's nonsense. Somebody say amen. And so I have a couple questions I want to ask you. Mutational science says that things have to evolve gradually. They cannot happen quickly. So what good is a duck with one wing? Mutation scientists says that today's scientists recognize that random mutations are actually rare events. Everyone say rare. rare. They almost always kill the creature. And I don't mean to be disrespectful, but take into the beautiful children I just showed you and think about the mathematical probability of reproduction. Mutation science says that something that has had a bad mutation in the DNA gene actually is less likely to live and more likely to produce offspring that is sterile. Minor improvements would be unlikely to help a creature like an eye with no retina. Can you see uh, a monkey walking around with one eye that hadn't been developed and another eye that hadn't been developed? This is going to look stupid, but just look at my stupidity for a minute and I'll explain their stupidity. Walking around with one eye and the other eye is not formed. And then all of a sudden his bipedality hasn't been formed, so he doesn't have the ability to walk on two legs. Why? Because he doesn't have the right pelvis, he doesn't have the right femur, and he doesn't have the right carrying angle. And so all of a sudden this half animal trapped in stratification as far as transitional forms is walking around trying to be in a world where the survives, only the fittest survive. What do you think the chances of me surviving is going to be? For a mutation to give a creature any advantage, it must be functional. And what good is half of a wing or a whale trapped in an ocean with the lung of a land animal? The sheepdog was a mammal and had a, a lung of a land mammal. And you're telling me that he transitioned through microevolution into a whale that had to redo his lungs so he could dive 700 feet underneath the ocean? 
Remember, evolution has to happen slowly. So the chances of something dying is really quick. What most people don't know is that Darwin didn't write one book. He didn't write one origin of the species. He wrote six editions and spent his entire life rewriting the origins of the species. Darwin was actually studying for the ministry at the age of 14. His mother was a devout Christian and his wife was a devout Christian. But Darwin's mom and Darwin's dad and Darwin's granddad were agnostics who studied evolution. Darwin didn't invent evolution, he put it on the map. And so his theories in the sixth edition started realizing that there's some problems with the fossil records and there's some problems with the mutations going on and that unlikely of mutations and natural selections actually producing an organ system and a new species. What did I just say? I just said a land animal who had the lungs to breathe in hair transformed into an aquatic being that now breathes underneath the water. Do you know what kind of re-engineering that's going to take? Not to mention the eyeball. Somebody give God a hand clap of praise if you don't mind. All right. Just exactly how does an earthworm or a centipede arise bit by bit? The truth is Darwin believed that the human cell was simple. And we now know that the human cell is not simple. There it is. That it was extremely complex and that DNA, the sequence of life, three billion letters all in an order and language is a sign of intelligence. And there is a reason. Monkeys can communicate but they cannot speak. You want to know why? And let me tell you about evolution. God created humans uniquely. Human beings, a man and a woman, is the only created being that has sex looking at each other face to face. Anything else is animalistic. And Darwin says that the cell was simple and was insignificant. We now know that's just not true. We have blood cells and muscle cells. We have over a trillion cells in our body. We have over a trillion connections in our body. We have fluids in the heart that pump three different fluids in three different directions and never gets it mistaken or, or messed up. We have an eyeball that could not have evolved. It had to absolutely come together at one point in time. We have kidney, kidneys that are useful, uh, that removes bad bacteria and bad waste from us. The human body is a miracle. But in these DNA, there's trillions of cells in your body. And DNA takes information. It speaks to the cell. Do you realize the one way you know you're a human is you have the ability to speak language? There is no evolutionary benefit to language. It doesn't exist. I can tell you to come here. I can tell you to stop. I can tell you that I'm the big monkey. I can tell you I love you. And that Jesus loves you. And that you're not a mistake. That God has destiny, young man, for your life. That you're not like the animals. You bury your dead. You create art that's beautiful. You have ambidextrous hands to where your fingers and your thumbs are unlike an ape. You have the ability of language to communicate intimacy and build community. You have the ability to look up and say, God, I love you. I love you. And then an ironic that we Pentecostals believe that God gave us a language as well. Cancer comes from DNA mutations. So here's what we know about mutations. Before 1950, we really didn't know much about it. But today we have a lot more information, much more than Darwin had. And we know, and listen to this, we know that the cell structure is extremely stable. 
We know that the cells, and there are a trillion of them in your body, they're so stable, ladies and gentlemen, that almost without exception, they remain absolutely unchanged and are accurately copied to their offspring in the time of reproduction. And we know that molecule structures of the genes do alter, and this phenomenon is called mutations. But mutations can be analyzed by scientists, but mutations most commonly result in one chemical chain amidst thousands of changes in the molecular uh, component of a gene. And so we f know that, in fact, the DNA itself is usually changed so slightly through mutations when it's possible that even a laboratory cannot detect the changes in your, uh, your DNA. Subtle molecular alterations have drastic consequences. Almost all mutations are dangerous to life. Of all the mutations studied, scientists conclude not one single clearly Evidence of survivability amongst a living creature from a mutated being. It appears that the Creator realized the inherent danger of mutations. And do you know what God did inside of you? Have you ever wondered whether God loves you? Look up at the stars. Ever want to know whether God loves you? Study cosmology. But if you want to know whether God loves you, think about the trillion cells that each one of those cells actually fight for your survival. Actually, the cells, scientists know, fight against mutations. That cells in the human body are designed by God to fight you having cancer. And to fight you having four legs. And to fight you with an eyeball in the wrong place. Why does it happen? Christianity is the only one with the answer, the fall. But one of these days, in a twinkling of an eye, the dead in Christ are going to rise first. Then those of us who remain shall be caught up, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And he's going to renew the heavens, and he's going to renew the earth, and the old things are going to pass away. And behold, all things are going to become new, and death, hell, and the grave are going underneath his feet. Shout amen and give God a praise break. Give him praise. Give him praise in this place right now. Slap your neighbor and say amen. amen. That brother Perry makes me want to go through hell with a water gun. <laughs> Evolution depends upon mutations. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. Here's what we know. Let's assume that the first cell really did come into existence. This will really require the cell to travel up the evolutionary ladder from a simple beginning to a complex human cell that has the ability to generate enormous new genetic information by itself. No DNA code is essential to manufacture skin, eyes, nerves, bones, hearing, muscle, blood. You can only give life when DNA gives it to the cell. However, the study of modern genetics show that mutations lead to a net loss of information in reproduction. Mutations, when they do occur, do not increase the total amount of information contained in the cell. If they don't kill the cell, they clearly decrease the information to the cell. Give God a hand clap of praise. Amen. Now I'm getting to the monkeys, i got to go. Mutations in knowledge. Therefore, how can mutations possibly account for the enormous amount of new information required for new creatures in macroevolution? Furthermore, since most mutant genes produce sterile offsprings, how can mutated cells pass on new genetic information to offspring so that something that survives and is fit can be more fit than those that don't survive? The truth is beneficial mutations are only wishful thinking. Mutations do not produce new information or superior creatures. No scientific evidence exists to the contrary. In real life, the probability that a gene, listen to this precious people, will mutate is often less than one in a million. Here's the problem for our friends. Biological theory calls for the incorporation of beneficial variants in the living population. A vast majority of the mutants observed in any organism are detrimental to the welfare of life and are therefore legal, lethal. 
Mutations are lethal, excuse me. Good mutations are so rare that we consider all of them bad. Actually research and cover the fact that cells have safeguards to protect us from genetic errors. DNA information cannot be copied except with many different enzymes checking to make sure your health is okay. I'm married into a family of physicians. One of the things my father-in-law was telling me he owns a bunch of healthcare systems is that he was a structural engineer and he's also a medical doctor. He says medicine is now going to come to the place to where they inject in you after studying your DNA and they have identified what's wrong with you and the possible mutations and they'll be able to speak to your genetic uh, structure in your body and give you medicine to your genetic structure eventually. Yet Darwinism demands that every single plant or animal would require thousands of years in luck. luck. Regarding all mutations that have been analyzed, it's doubtful that a single one can be clearly said to increase survivability. Evolutionists assert that a small number of mutations can eventually happen. They throw around the word 1 in 10,000. This is not based on any science because watch. Time and mutations. How long does it take? Evolutions often use the number 1 in 10,000. However, this is not one single shred of evidence. Evolutions know that these mutations, if they existed at all, would take place slowly, and anything more than a slight mutation would be too disruptive. So therefore, assume that it is possible for this to be true. The mutations must pass on specific to the genes. And remember that cells have built-in mechanisms that keep them from giving bad information to the genes. Evolutionists say the greater the total number of mutations, the more likely that a mutation is going to happen and macroevolution is going to come into existence. But it must happen gradually and slowly. This doesn't take thousands of years. It takes millions of years. So if a dinosaur actually evolved into a bird, we're talking about mutation time of billions of years. Thus, there's not enough time in the 570 million years of evolution to allow for mutational changes. Their own time goes against us, goes against them. Evolutionists say that we're 96% as the monkey. Oh, it burns me up when I hear them say that. You're 98% the same as a monkey. I got something to tell you. Number one, you're wrong. It's 88%. While there's a 4% difference, let's assume the 88% to be true, which means the quality, quantity of new information to make up a man into a monkey would be a 500 page book with 12 million words in it all spelled correctly. A human itself has within them information of 1,500 page books in your body. Therefore, the 40 large books would automatically be arranged in intelligent sentences with the genetic system randomly and no help from outside sources. So to say that you are the same as a monkey, 88%, that's true. But what's the difference of the 4% or the other percent? 500, 1,000 page books, all spelled correctly, all in line with no mistakes. That didn't happen by accident. When it comes to new genetic information, think about this. Populated genetic calculations show that animals with 20 years between each generation could pass on no more than 1,700 mutations in 10 million years. But only 1 in 10,000 mutations are potentially beneficial. Therefore, it is not likely that even one positive mutation is going to happen in evolution. So how can mutations achieve over millions of years? Let me show you something. Then we're going to get to the monkeys. Do you know what mutations means? It means that something the size of a sheepdog took its respiratory system and began to remove itself, reconstruct its muscles, his nostrils at the top of his head and put a blowhole there. It means that the locomotive structure in front of his legs had to turn from being legs to flippers. It means that his muscular skeleton system had to convert its ball joints to a tail that moves up and down and that his dentitions had to remove all of his teeth to replace his teeth with flanges. It also means that the urinary tract system had to completely reorganize the kidney tissue to accommodate the intake of salt water. It therefore means that his cardiopulmonary system lungs had to be drastically enlarged and renovated to withstand 700 feet depths and dives. Thermal regulation, the removal of fur had to be replaced by blubber in layers so that the animal would be alright. 
Sensory organisms, the modification of the ear, the eyes, and the skin had to work effectively in an adequate environment, and the reproductive system had to be completely at all haul. The sensory organs had to be modified, and the male and female reproduction system had to be completely redeveloped over billions of years. Please tell the Easter Bunny I said hello. Somebody give God a hand clap of praise, and we're going to... Please just give me some time. All right. Cornell University, what are the chances of transferring the leg of a mammal into a flipper? Cornell University said that they could find that it would take over 100 million years just to give two coordinated mutations. That's problematic because evolution says that land mammals developed over 9 million years. In addition, the geological record shows a difference. And it's simply not rational or biological or mathematical to think that mutations could produce that kind of evolution. So what does the evolutionist say? He says if there was an effective breeding population of, say, 100 million individuals and they could produce a new generation every single day, the likelihood of obtaining good evolutionary results from mutations could be expected only about once in 274 billion years. What you have to understand is that this, uh, the pr study of prob uh, probabilities to purpose and argue that mutations even tandem with natural selection or the root causes for six million viable enormously complex species is to mock logic. All living things are characterized by incredible complexity. And evolution demands that life comes from dead material, yet research has shown that over a hundred years from the work of Louis Pasteur that life cannot come from no life. Now I want to take you very quickly and let you understand man. Evolution says that man came and evolved through macroevolution through a monkey. Creationism says we created in the image of God. And when you study about the origins of man, this is what you see. You see these crazy little lunatics running around like cavemen. But when they say that they have found prehistoric man and that he was once an ape, here's how they come to those conclusions. They come to it through comparative anatomy analysis, embryos, behavior arguments, but never the fossil records. So what, and watch these pictures closely. You're looking at the remains of what they say 60,000 years old. It's a Neanderthal. And so what I want to do as I close is prepare you very well to look and go to museums, to read your textbooks. The fossil records for humans what we know is that there's close to 250 million fossils that have been found with 250,000 species. Approximately 95% of all the fossils are marine invertebrates, like I showed you, are invertebrates. Only vertebrates, animals with bones, account for 0.25% of the fossils. But monkeys and men in the fossil record only account for 0.001%. That is not what the news tells you. The clear majority of fossils are aquatic. And didn't the Bible say that the world was flooded? Most all of them are, are within a, a flood plain. So when you look at the evidence for human evolution... Darwin said, if species have descended from other species but by fine graduations, do we not everywhere see innumerable transitional forms? The answer, Mr. Darwin, is no, we don't. Therefore, what we know about fossils, which are a record of death when it comes to man, is that they are formed with rapid burial under sediments and that the conditions are rarely met in terrestrial environments. You have to be in water to build a fossil, very seldom will you be in terrestrial mountain regions, desert regions, and find a fossil that will become fossilized. The Bible said the world was flooded. And in case you don't believe that, the man that found the Titanic is now digging at the Black Sea, and he's found a civilization flooded 250 times the water force of Niagara Falls, 500 feet underneath the Black Sea, and now knows that the world was flooded, and he dates it at the exact time of Noah. Wow. 75% of the Earth's land is covered with stratification, i got to go because I want to get to the monkeys. Think about this. The global flood would have provided optimal conditions. The vast majority of land-dwelling creatures were clearing the water. What did the evolutionists say? Somebody pushed them into the lake. That's a lot of busy cavemen. 
quick, the world's coming to an end. Push them in the river. Now hang on, don't leave. Here's what they call you, bunch of Pentecostal midget-minded bigots. There's literally more fossil evidence. Oh, this is so full of malarkey. That humans evolved from non-humans than there is fossil evidence of a dinosaur rex. Baloney. Baloney based on science. What is the level of fossil records amongst primates and human beings in the fossil record? 0.001%. But yet some dodo bird on the internet wants to act like he's smarter than born-again Christians. As a Christian, you don't have to take a back seat to nobody. You serve a God that created the heavens and the earth and Kepler, the greatest scientist ever in the history of the world, still informs NASA on how to get a spaceship to the moon. And the kind of God I serve is a scientist and he knows more than any molecular biologist. Somebody give God a head clap of praise. Hey! That'll make a Mormon run. Slap your neighbor and go amen. 0.001%. Evolutionists say it took 600 million years. Creationists says, and God said. Therefore, what percentage of various kinds of animals living today have been found in the fossil records? And the fossil records were very incomplete. If they were, like Darwin said, we'd be in trouble. But however, out of the 43 land-dwelling mammals with vertebrae living today, one or more fossilized representations have been found. So out of 43, we found 42 fossils. That's 97% of the fossil records for land mammals. If the 329 families of terrestrial vertebrates living today, we have found 261 of those families. Families of horses, families of rhinos, families of snakes. And you know what they just found? I love telling you this, and I don't have a lot of time left. But what they love telling you, what I want to tell you, is you know what archaeologists and paleontologists just found? They just found a couple of things. Number one, Stephen Hawkins came out and said, i got to tell you guys something. Stephen Hawkins is brilliant, but he's an agnostic. His wife was a Christian. And Stephen Hawkins says, I was discovering most respected scientists in the world. He says, I got a news flash. And all the news media ran to Stephen Hawkins. You know what he said? I have discovered that the earth had a beginning. You don't say. <laughs> Do you know what archaeologists just found? They found the oldest living snake in the world. This is a true story. You Google it. Or watch the videos from ISO. I talk about it. Do you know what that snake had on his back? You're looking at it. Legs. And what did the Bible say about them little snakes? It said he walked around. Don't you think it's interesting, Brother Perry, that when Satan showed up, he didn't show up as God. He didn't show up as a celestial being. He didn't even try to show up as a homo sapien. He showed up as an animal. Something lower than a man. And he's still trying to lie to some of you using animals. Now, going quickly. Going quickly. If I push the right button, it'd help. 88% of all European mammals have been found. 99% of all animals that exist today have been found in the fossil record. Therefore, the fossil record itself appears to be remarkably rich and clearly sufficient to reveal if any creatures had slowly evolved in intermediate stages into distinctively different kinds of creatures. This is the part that I've struggled with all my life. I sit at the British Museum. Ever notice that you go to an amusement park and it costs $300? You go to a museum and it costs $26. An amusement park, amusement means a place where you don't think. Museum means a place where you do think. That it actually costs more not to think than it does to think. <laughs> I 
got to go quick because I'm out of time, but the Bible says you made him a little lower than the angels. And this is the lie they tell us. Human primate fossils are rare. They're so rare that most paleontologists have never handled a real pair of bones. And if you were to take all the bones paleontologists and anthropologists and geologists and archaeologists have ever found of prehistoric man, it would not fill a casket. Evolution begins with the assumption. We know what those are by now. But let me tell you something. Watch this. And I wish I had time to get, go Google, the, go, download the notes this week. I have extensive notes. It always bothered me because evolutionists told me that the way in which you know Homo sapiens from prehistoric primitive man was the size of the skull. We know that it is a fact that monkeys have much smaller brains than humans. And it bothered me for years, but the cranial capacity of the skull is large in humans and small in monkeys. So when you look at a skull and they say, that's a monkey, that's a monkey, that's a monkey man, that's a monkey man, and that's a monkey man, the first place to start is the brains. And when you put them side by side of a homo sapien with a chimp or an orangutan, you will see that the cranium is completely different. That a monkey's skull has a smaller brain, which really has nothing to do with intelligence. You need to really look at neural science and the, the uh, connections in the human brain compared to that of a chimpanzee. But there's a huge difference between a human brain and a gibbon. You also need to understand that the foramen, for, foramen magnum that on a monkey is different than what is on uh, a human being. In other words, the foramen magnum on a human being is a hole in the middle of the skull. In a chimpanzee, it's at the bottom. At the dog, it's in the back. So when they say this is human, the first place you want to look is at this foramen magnum. When you look at a foramen magnum and place it next to a primate, you will notice that the hole of a foramen magnum in a human is in the middle to support bipedality, walking on two feet, but the foramen magnum on a monkey is in the back. You will also need to look at the skull and understand the slope of a skull is different. The human face can be seen in near vertical position, but an ape's face slopes. And the eye sockets of an ape are bony and obscured by its broad, flat face. There is a difference between the vertical position of apes and the sloping of the face and the sloping of a homo sapien or a human being. You can look at the side view of a human being and see them in the eyes. That is why they call monkeys googled eyes. You then can take a look at the flat surface of uh, the forehead of a monkey. And you'll notice that the eye sockets on an ape are flat, but they're curved in humans. From a side view, the skull, the bony socket of the ape's orbit, is obscured by its broad, flat face. Humans, on the other hand, have horizontal curved upper face and foreheads, and also the orbit of the human eye is slightly wider than it is tall, while the orbit, the, the orifice of the eye of an ape is usually slightly taller than wide. One makes a Google-eyed human or a Google-eyed uh, animal, and another one has clear view. You can tell just by the eye sockets that one is a monkey and one is an, uh, a human being. Then when you take a good look at the, the way uh, the flat nose and the protruding of the nasal cavity, on an orangutan or a chimpanzee, there is no place to hang your sunglasses. God loves for us to wear sunglasses. Can I get a shout amen? Humans have... A, a, a septum that is different than an ape. 
An ape does not have the flat protruding nasal bones. Apes have flat nasal bones. And in addition, the nasal bone of a human protrudes out and an ape protrudes, does, it has a, a nasal bone that can be protruded. That's a fancy way to say you can't break a monkey's nose. But you can break this human being's nose. Now, when you begin to look at jaws and teeth. And these are really important because tooth enamel is the most hardest substance and the way evolutionists want to say that this is a human being in its developmental stages. No, it's not. Look at its cranium. No, it's not. Look at its nose. No, it's not. Look at its teeth. Because a primate has lower enamel than a human being does on its teeth. And most of what they have to work with are teeth and jaw bones. They don't have complete structures. So when you look at an orangutan and you look at a monkey and you look at the teeth of a human being, you see that there's a different structure to it even down to the molars and how the molars of a teeth of a monkey are formed and how the molars of a human being or a canine are formed. You can even take a look at Ramapithecus, which they call a pre-human being. And you will see that the teeth that they're calling pre-humans actually fit that of an ape and not a human being. Therefore, this is a lie and we've known it since Time Magazine. When you look at the pelvis, you will understand that the pelvis of a human being and the pelvis of a chimpanzee are completely different based on bipedality. Bipedality is where a human being walks like this. Monkeys have to walk like this because they don't have bipedal motion. And when you begin to understand that the human pelvis is shaped differently than the monkey pelvis because the monkey pelvis can only walk like this, but to walk like this with a gait, you have to have a pelvis like a human being. So it supports the internal organs. It's short and broad. It, it's an adductor to the, uh, the muscles. But a chimp pelvis is longer and narrow and hangs below the organs. It's at a different position than the pelvis of a human being. And the muscles are stronger here than up here because of the way the pelvis is in an orangutan. You look at the skeleton, you'll see the difference. The knee of a human being can lock. And you can get behind it and it folds. Monkeys don't have that ability. The very fact that your knees lock is proof that you're human. If your knees did not lock, it was proof that you're not human. And so what you have to understand, to walk effectively like a human being with a human gait, where you have arches in your feet, that the pelvis has to be wider, the femurs have to slant, the knees have to have close together, and the knees of a monkey are like this. But a human knee are close together. The femur goes in and helps me support weight where it needs to be supported. You can even look at the, the bones of a monkey and how it curves and the femur of a homo sapien. You can even see that the skeleton of a modern human, the femur and the pelvis go in to support the weight for bipedality. bipedality. But the monkey is like this. And over here, there's a wide stance. And then notice the hands that grip. When you look at the feet of a monkey and a human, you'll notice that the human toe goes out. But on a monkey, the toe goes out because the toe actually serves as a thumb to a monkey. And then you will notice that an ape uses its foot to grasp branches. But a human big toe is large and it points forward to a thrust so that there's a human gait. More on the internet about that. When you look at the foot of a human, he has a large heel, an ankle, and he has a midfoot, and he has an abducted big toe in line with other digits. But when you look at the foot of a monkey, he has a small heel, he has a flexible midfoot, and he grasps with his big toe. When you look at an animal, yes, some apes can stand up rightly. But when you watch them walk for long periods of time, they must walk this way because of the pelvis. Then you understand that bipedality changes 
for monkeys to walk like humans, they would have to have a completely different structural system that did not enable them to walk like humans, which is called bipedality, which means you walk on two feet. To walk on two feet, you have to have a foot that is specific to human beings with arches in it. Your arches are different than that of a monkey. A monkey cannot walk all the time on a... Um, uh, on dirt because uh, on two legs because he doesn't have the arches to do so. And so when you look at a gorilla's foot, it goes out. When you look at a homo sapien, it stays f- stable because of the arches. And then when you look at how a human walks, according to a monkey walks, you'll see the difference. When a human walks, he walks with his toes. A monkey walks on all four. And he walks on all four using his thumb as a ability to grasp trees as well. And so what you find out is that footprints become extremely important in apologetics between apes and humans. Because you're looking at the oldest human footprints in the history of the earth. And they want to tell you it was an ape. That's impossible because they have arches. That's impossible because the big toe leads the way. That's impossible because the foots tell us that there is no bipedality, that there is bipedality, there is no walking on all fours. And by these ancient footprints, We know that those ancient people were actually human. Man, would you come on up? I got to go through quickly in this last part. But you look at the hand and the difference. Matter of fact, take your hands and put it up in front of you like this. Notice that your thumb reaches above your knuckles. It's impossible for an ape to do that. Notice, put your thumb back up, guys. Notice that your thumb is large and goes upon your knuckles. Look at the hand of a monkey, his short thumb. Everybody do this. One, two, three, four, five. One, come on, do it. Three, four, five. Two, come on, take your thumb and touch all four fingers. That is impossible for a primate simply because of the position of the thumb. They're knuckle walkers. I could talk about the chest. I could talk about the collarbone. I could talk about the pelvis. I could show you the difference between a pelvis of a monkey and a pelvis, the scapula of a human being, completely different. I can show you the backbone where it's different than a monkey. I can show you the skin. Monkeys don't perspire anywhere except underneath their arms. I can look at the skeleton of an ape and a skeleton of a man and show you all kinds of differences. I could go all day and show you the difference between a monkey and an ape. But they want to tell you that your ancestor named Lucy and that these fossil records, oh, that's a gorgeous thing, isn't it? Well, she's gorgeous. This is important, and I'm out of time, and I've got a lot more to go, but that's okay. It's a very, very deep, complex subject. And I'll close on time to be respectful. But you have to be careful when you go into a museum because you know how they developed this prehistoric person? Keep in mind, they have 0.001% of the fossil records. Keep in mind that there is a difference in the anatomy of an ape and an anatomy of a human being. But they use artistic license. Because remember I taught you in the beginning that only hard tissue survives, mostly teeth and jaws. So how did they know the color, the color of the eyes, the hair, The lips, that kind of stuff. It's artistic licensing to support a world view. Take a good look. I love Planet of the Apes. Another bias. Everybody look at Planet of the Apes. Did you notice one thing about that movie? The new movie comes out this July. Can't wait to see it. Because I know it's a bunch of farce. (laughs) 
But that monkey in Planet of the Apes had blue eyes. And then when I look at Caesar, Caesar, there's something wrong about Caesar. That's exactly right, Brother Stone. He looks too human. But if someone help me and tell me why he looks too human. No, not just that. Look deeper. The eyes. Watch this. All primates have dark scaly. I'm going to pronounce that wrong. And human beings have white sclera. Yes, thank you. Humans have white sclera. And monkeys have brown skull era. But when Hollywood tells their little stories, wow. and soft tissue does not survive. And so they say Lucy is your ancestor. <laughs> Go to the internet. That's all they found of the Ariopithecus. But yet this is what they came up with. If it looks like a monkey, swings like a monkey, has a thumb like a monkey, a pelvis like a monkey, an eye socket like a monkey, I have a prophetic word. Thus saith the Lord God, it's a monkey. Australopithecus, good looking old brother there. Australopithecus and meanness. Africanus, the toucan boy. Afraninus, Sinus, has not tongues. And there's Lucy. And there's the only bones they found. And that's the only skull they found. But look what they did. But it gets worse. Take a good look and tell me what's wrong with this picture. Number one, her pelvis is that of an ape. Her head, her skull is that of an ape. Her quadrupedal motion, I think I pronounced that right, is that of an ape. She's a knuckle walker. But yet if you go to any museum, they will say still to this day because they have not updated the science. All evolutionists know that Lucy was a monkey. But everybody look. They got breast on this one. They got hair all over that one. And look at the color of the eyes. But show me what's wrong with this picture. The foot. What's wrong with it? They didn't find a foot. But that's a human foot, Brother Perry. And if you go look at it at uh, New York or anywhere else, they've put a human foot. And the guy that designed her as an artist put her eyes the way it is, and I quote, unquote, so that I would put inside of her a human soul. But did they find white eyes, soft tissue? Did they find any feet? No, they did not. There's another good looking boy. One evolutionist after another evolutionist says it's not true. And the problem is, there's what they found to Lucy. But now they know Lucy is not real, but yet the museums haven't changed. You look at this group, and look at that good looking guy, and look at this one, and look at that one, homo group, which is supposed to be modern man, homo habilis, homo rudiophenis, uh, homo erectus. Look at the Java man. Look at the Peking man. Look at the Homo Heidelberg genus. Look at the Neanderthal man. And then look at the Nebraska man. And then realize you just got into a huge problem. How many of you remember what happened in Tennessee with the Scopes monkey trial? They used him as proof that evolution was real. And do you know what they used to paint this picture? A pig's tooth. All they had of the Nebraska man was a tooth. But the artist developed that from a tooth. And they found out 40 years later that it was the pig's tooth and that some paleontologist, some paleontologist wanted to be famous. 
And then the Piltdown Man. They took a human skull and tied it to the jaw of an orangutan. And then they said, cro he's different than the Neanderthal. Well, that was until recently, and they found a burial ground. And guess who was buried next to each other on the same fossil record level? The cro and the Neanderthal. They say you got similar DNA. We've already talked about that. And at the end of the day, here's what you're dealing with. It's a bunch of dead monkeys following a dead man. And the next time they tell you <laughs> that you're 88% the same as a monkey, tell them that you are 40% the same as lettuce. <laughs> and tell them you're 80% cow. <laughs> and then bring up feet. And bring up the fact that they found prehistoric feet with prehistoric dinosaur footprints. And bring up the Guadalupe woman who was found at the lowest level of the fossil record way before evolutionists say animals or plants ever evolved. Or bring up the footprint found in New Mexico before humans or animals or plants ever evolved in the fossil record. Let me tell you why they do this and I'm closing. Nobel Peace Prize winner. I will not accept, listen to this, Brother Perry, I will not accept that creation philosophically because I do not want to believe in God. Therefore, I choose to believe in that which I know is scientifically impossible, spontaneous genera generations arising in evolution. Wow. Now, let me tell you why this is dangerous and this is going to be highly offensive. The Bible says death is not our friend and evolution is a theory of death. But Charles Darwin was the greatest inspiration to Adolf Hitler and Karl Marx. Stephen Jay Gould at Harvard University, a paleontologist, says that biological arguments for racism may have been common before 1850, but they increased by orders of magnitude following the acceptance of evolutionary theory. Darwin, respectfully, was an adamant racist. An adamant racist. And it gets, you know what gets me going? All of these liberals walking around calling you and I bigots and homophobes and mental midgets, they're guilty of what they accuse us of being. They're anti-woman because Jesus was the one that elevated the role of women. They are anti-life. Uh, they, anti they are the ones that are racist. Darwin said, at some future period, not very distant as measured by centuries, the civilized races of man will almost certainly exterminate and replace the savages that are races throughout the world. The break between man and his nearest allies will then become wider, for it will intervene between man and the more civilized state and some ape or between what is a Negro or a gorilla. Darwin was a racist. There are no aborigines because they killed them all trying to build a supreme race. Abortion was created by Margaret Sanger and here's what she said. The most merciful thing that a large family does is to kill its infants for population control. But here's what she also said. It's so offensive, I don't want to read it. You read it yourself. She called my African American friends weeds that needed to be exterminated through natural selection. The chief distinction by the intellectual powers of the two sexes, Darwin said, is that man attains a higher eminence than a woman. I will not be telling that to Jenny Knight, Sister Pale. <laughs> My wife is much smarter than I am. Adolf Hitler said, if nature does not wish that weaker individuals should mate with the stronger, she wishes even less that a superior race should intermingle with an inferior one, because in such a case, all of our efforts throughout hundreds of thousands of years to establish an evolutionary higher stage of being must thus be rendered futile. Mein Kampf means the survival of the fittest. Karl Marx, the classes and the races are too weak to master a new condition. They must perish in the revolutionary holocaust. Millions of people died. Charles Darwin knew the Bible. 
At 58, he was giving money to a missionary, but he said the Bible was full of lies and that there was no God and that he was a revengeful tyrant. Evolution does not have the answers to life or why you're created in the image of God. Every single one of you are special and you have a purpose. And I'd love to give an altar call, but I'm out of time. I'm respectful to authority. But if you're trying to find out if there's a reason for living, I'm going to give you a chance to come and stand right here before me and, and go on a journey with me and say, I'm going to learn all I can learn, but there's got to be a God. Three billion letters, the position of the earth, the star formation system of the cosmology of the Milky Way is not the same as the star formations of any other universe that they've ever found. Our star formation produces three to six stars a year. Other universes, other galaxies produce so many star systems that life is inhabitable. But yet we just happen to be on the right planet to where the stars are in our favor. And God says, look up and count them. I know them all by name. You may be struggling as to whether there's a God or not. I've been there. You're looking at the fool that shook his hand at Lee College and said, you could be my mother's God and you'd be my father's God. As for me, you leave me the hell alone. And a little man named Charles Beach said, come here, boy. And I began to put it together and learn the scriptures and how to defend it. And I began to wrestle with evolution and creationism and theistic evolution and cosmology and anthropology and animals. And I realized that, doggone it, a sea turtle has a magnet in his head that when he gets in the water, sends him to another island. And then when he gets ready to reproduce, he's got a built-in GPS system that brings him back to the very spot he was laid at as an egg. I begin to realize that God created a He created a dolphin that is greater ability and intellect than the greatest submarine. It has a sonar ability to speak and call each dolphin by name. I realized that the whale has a streak on his neck that's a gift from God. And had the streak not been there, it looks like a white line. He would not be able to open his mouth wide enough to eat enough food and would starve to death. And I thought, God, if you care about the whale and you care about the sockeye salmon and you care about the sea turtle and you care about dolphins, how much more do you care about me this morning? If you love me enough to put the right star system in my universe to protect me, and put the right dirt underneath my feet, tectonic plates that give me life, and put the oceans at the right depths to interact with the mountains after the flood, and to give me the right water on the right planet that's different than the seawater, how much more will you answer my prayer tonight? I'm not going to ask you to close your eyes. I'm going to ask you to open your eyes. And I'm going to count to three, and if you want to make things right with God, I want you to come and go on a journey. You don't have to have all the answers. But I know in here right now in my heart, there's someone not right with God. And I know you're listening to me and that you may have been raised in religion and you've seen all the horrible things of religion. You say religion has been responsible for horrendous acts. Yes, you're right. But not Jesus. You've talked about people who who misinterpret Christianity. But there's no misinterpreting evolution. It is a theory of death. Even Darwin has said, said, himself said that evolution requires agnosticism. I don't know who you are, and you may not come, and I'll go to my hotel room and sleep like a baby because I know I'll obey God and that you're in this room. Yeah. The Holy Ghost is calling you. You were called to preach as a little boy. And you've been running from it all your life. God's had a call on your life, little lady. And you're just not right with God. Tonight's the night you're going to make it right because he loves you enough to put the right stars over your head. On the count of three, I want you to get up and come and stand with your eyes wide open, realizing exactly what you're doing with your intellect and your faith in the Spirit of God. One, I know you're here. You had no problem buying cocaine from a drug dealer. Don't be a coward tonight. 
too. You were drunk and made a fool of yourself in a bar and you didn't care who thought what then. One, two, thank you, darling. Three, come. Come.